Hey, everybody, it's Jen Budd, former senior patrol agent with the United States Border Patrol, former senior intelligence agent, now the uh, producer, developer of Border Patrol Watch. And today uh, I am pleased to have Joanne McAfee Maldonado. She is a native Delawarean. It seems a little hard to Delawarean. I think I said that right. <laughs> Residing on the ceded lands of the, can you pronounce this for me? The Nanticoke and Lenny Lenape tribes. Okay. Joanne has traveled to the El Paso and Juarez border in 2019. She wanted to go there to find out for herself what was going on. She's married to a Mexican national and was perplexed by the news reports of family separation and the dismantling of the legal asylum system. With her new and better educated perspective, she sought out additional education with Villanova University's VISTA program, and she became a DOJ accredited immigration law representative for migrants. So welcome, Joanne. Glad to have you with me today. Thanks for having me, Jen. I'm excited to be here. So originally, we were thinking about talking about the asylum system and all the different steps that go into the asylum system. And I think one of the immigration guys on Twitter had put out the, a big flow chart. And then within just weeks, it's already changed because they're constantly changing the rules and the laws and stuff. So, and you had said, you know, people are so inundated with information and just they're, they're tired. And um, why don't we talk about personal stuff or about why we decided to do this kind of work and what drew us into it. And I touched on it a little bit with your opening and, and, introducing you what is it that has caused you to change what you were originally doing and perhaps maybe even thinking i'm not sure you'll tell us what caused you to to change your job and, and take up you know immigrant rights as, as something that that you hold dear what really caught my attention for um just really wanting more knowledge about what was going on with immigration was um <laughs> When Trump was running for office, I started to realize that as he said more things concerning immigrants, that the people around me were all of a sudden um, feeling very free to give their opinions about those things as well. And it was shocking to me because these were people that I had known for 25 years that I never would have guessed felt the way that they did. And being married to a Mexican man, um, I, you know, it was one of those things where, oh, but he's one of the good ones. You know, he's, he, he's um, got a green card and he's this and he's that, and, you know. So um, I think that was probably like the first thing that made me say, I don't understand. Like, I don't know a lot about this, but I, I want to learn because this is just really frustrating me that people are so quick to judge people they know nothing about. They had no proximity to anyone that was going through immigration or, you know, who came from another country, unless it might be like their neighbor down the street that they wave at once in a while. But they weren't having meals with these people. They weren't sitting down and actually getting to know what was going on in their lives or, you know, what that process was like, or even what it's like for the children of people who are undocumented, who don't even know that they, you know, that they're parents are undocumented until ICE shows up, you know, like there's all these things that that are weighing on, you know, the the lives of migrants in our country that people are just completely out of touch with. So that was my first kind of intro. And then I think watching the news, the, the first thing that really, really like got me was that audio clip of the kids in CBP custody that were crying. Yeah, and the Border Patrol agent is like, what do we have here? We've got an orchestra here. And you can hear a baby saying, mom, yes. poppy. Yeah, that was pretty hard. Oh, man, that was so heartbreaking. And I mean, I have two kids that are grown now, but um, just thinking about those babies. And, and I think that that probably was you know, what drew a lot of attention to um, immigration for women 
especially because, you know, like all the moms were like, wait a minute, we're taking their babies. Why are we doing that? Um, it, it was like all of a sudden Trump put this policy in place that said if you cross and you don't have papers, you're a felon. Right. I think that's right. kind of how it was going. Yeah, they criminal <laughs> they criminalized uh, illegal entry in because so back in my day, it was an administrative charge. I've never put anybody in jail for for crossing the border without papers um, unless they had some other crime, like they were also smuggling drugs or they had a prior warrant. The Border Patrol itself, we can, we can go from president to president to president, but the Border Patrol itself has been wanting to do this for a long time. And and they finally uh, got somebody under Trump who was like, yeah, let's, let's go ahead and go all the way and just take their children just simply for crossing without any other cause or justification. Yeah. So you ended <laughs> so, up going down to the border, right? You went down I to did, El Paso, yeah. Morris. I did. Um, there was an opportunity that came up with a group called Women of Welcome, and they were taking, you know, I think it was 22 of us. Um, it was just a quick trip. It was like three days. But the organization that we um, were there with, it was called Abara, and they were basically taking stuff over into the shelters like diapers and clothing and food and, you know, or taking money so that they could buy food on the other side since it's cheaper. Um, and also trying to support um, the migrants that needed help with their paperwork and things like that. So um, they were just very, um, I don't know. I just love them. I love that organization. Um, they, you know, talked to us about what was going on with the policy changes and they kind of, you know, made it in layman's terms so that everyone like could understand clearly what was going on. Um, and so the first day we were there, we just kind of, you know, hang out with them and, and um, learn some things. And then the second day we went over into Juarez and listening to stories of why people were coming. So I got to hear from someone from El Salvador and someone from Guatemala. And I knew that whatever reason they had for leaving was probably, you know, had some trauma involved, right? I, I expected that. And I also expected that the long trip to the border was probably, you know, filled with some, some really terrible things that they, you know, suffered or saw if, you know, even if it didn't happen to them that they witnessed. Um, what I did not expect was this is the part of the story where they said, and then we crossed and then Border Patrol was there. And then this is how we were treated because I was oblivious to any of that at that point. And I thought, this is the United States. We don't do that here, you know? <laughs> so yeah, very naive. Um, but I'm, it was good for me to hear those things because the part of me that takes responsibility as, you know, an American citizen said, that's not okay. You know, and right. okay, so now, now that I know this, what do I do with this information? Because I'm not, you know, we, <laughs> I was like, these people suffer trauma after trauma. They're they're here because they're extremely vulnerable, and then and then you're going to abuse them further. Like, I my mind was blown. So, and and the funny thing that, that happened after that was we actually got to talk to Border Patrol. We you know got to sit with them in this little like amphitheater and they came out and they had you know of course two people that were like hand picked for their PR skills and then. Um, a woman from HR, and it was like, right. Why do you or... care about HR? I mean, in the border patrol, <laughs> right? Jeez. But it was right around the time that they'd found out about that Facebook group. Um, oh, yeah, the I'm ten. Yep. And so somebody in our little audience raised their hand and said, "Hey, you know, we know this is under investigation. Can you give us any more information?" And the HR lady was like, oh, I'll take this one, you know. So she says, um, you know, it's still under investigation, so we really can't say a whole lot about it. But I just want to put it out there that 
when you work together in a really stressful environment, um, you have this camaraderie, you know, that you build with your coworkers. And sometimes you make jokes that, you know, other people wouldn't find funny, but it's it's not really meant in malice. It's it's just a, you know, a way to blow off steam and to kind of lessen the stress. And, you know, and, and we were all kind of like, what? <laughs> She said, if you had an ER doctor who was really stressed out, like he might say something to a nurse that, you know, you wouldn't appreciate because you don't work in that setting or whatever. And we were like, we wouldn't be joke. They better not be joking about killing people. Like that's not, you know, <laughs> what? Well, I mean, but even that explanation, it's like, it's one thing to be in the middle of an event like that. And, and I talk about that in the book with one of my friends when when my best friend, when we're in India and he's struggling to deal with what is a body that has been ripped apart and carried down the freeway by a truck. And he's joking. And some of the other guys are like, geez, look what I'm at. that fucked him up. And that's one thing. That's one thing. But then to go home and think about it and develop memes so that you can post them on a group and then joke about it and continue the joke and and, and all this other stuff. It, it's more than that. That is, you know, when that happened, I remember reporters calling me going, what do you think about this? And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, that's typical border patrol, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah. so they'll always make an excuse, but, but the, it's one thing when you're in the middle of the trauma and you make a joke to try and lighten everybody's mood and stuff, we're not talking about that. So, yeah. Right. So after we had that conversation with Border Patrol, there was a girl in the group, we got into the car to leave and she said, oh, I just feel so much better now. And I was like, about what? <laughs> yeah. And so, I thought, I don't know her, you know, like I'm, I'm on this trip. I just met her. I don't really know her. And I thought I'm not going to get into an argument with this woman. But when we stopped to use the restroom at like a mini mart or something, I pulled the director of, of a bar aside and I said, how do you reconcile the stories that you hear from the migrants about the things that have happened to them and what border patrol feeds you at these gatherings? And he said, well, you have to remember a couple things. One, he said, Border Patrol gives you the hand-picked people to come. These are the people that go into schools and talk to children about how great it is to be a Border Patrol agent. He yep. said, they've got all the fluff, you know? <laughs> they have a lot of training. And, and those officers are called press information officers, PIOs. And they really don't know much about the field they're not good field agents and so they go into the media and they do really well there and they just spin stuff they actually very few of them know what it's like to actually be a border patrol agent in the field so okay so yeah that that makes it even more interesting as i'm remembering the different things that they shared but um <laughs> So he said, there's that. He said, and then I've been doing this for 15 years. He said, and I've talked to migrants from all over the world. He said, it's not like they're meeting up at some central location in Mexico and collaborating a story. He said, and yet consistently they tell me how abusive Border Patrol is. He yeah. said, so I believe them. You know, and and it's been documented. I mean, if you Google it, it's like one NGO after another. Even the Border Patrol's own statistics and stuff show how bad it is, how bad they are uh, to migrants, and and they just cover it up by sham investigations. And they know if they just ignore it long enough, politicians move on to other things, and and so they just they get away with it. So gross. Yeah. So yeah, I think that was probably my big. Um, that was the big one where I just felt like there's no way I can do nothing anymore. You know, I, I had to figure out a way to advocate better to, you know, to get better education, to understand the laws, to, you know, be able to have conversations with elected officials and say like, you know, this is where we are. This is, you know, this is no good. Like, what are we doing here? Um, 
and then you know go into school because i wanted to actually my goal my end game goal is that i want to be able to um represent asylum seekers in court um mm -hmm. which i have to get the other part of the accreditation to do but i'm mm -hmm. i've signed up for the classes to get that done um so it probably won't be into next year but okay. But in the meantime, I'm, you know, helping people with like TPS and citizenship and all those things, getting their green cards and their work authorization. So, so what about for you, Jen? What was your like big aha moment that made you want to get into all this? Um, on the immigration rights side versus the border patrol side, my big aha moment was my suicide attempt. Um, in in 2015 February of 2015 and I just had gotten to the point of where I hated myself um and did not realize that that you know when I joined the border patrol I didn't even though I grew up in Alabama I didn't come from a conservative racist family per se and uh in fact we were considered pretty liberal and and yet I was still ignorant going in hadn't no idea what the border patrol was and everything and 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 you still see what i was going through in 2015 and agents today we still have the highest uh suicide number border patrol agents do um the stats are very high and even the national guard that's now down there doing stuff in texas they're starting to have suicides and um i think what most people don't understand is that when you become an oppressor, it, it tends to be very gradual. They give you lots of reasons why you're doing what you're doing in the border patrol. And it kind of makes sense at first as you're learning things. And then, and I, I just think people don't understand what it does when, when you treat people as less than human, when you're when your managers are constantly in front of the press calling you heroes, but you realize the policies you're enforcing are sending people out there and they're getting, you know, they're being placed in danger and they're crossing in dangerous areas, especially when they close the asylum system and there's nowhere for people to go. And then therefore they're just trying to escape uh, the, the death and the brutality that they're facing only to then cross the border and face it again. And it's just not how it's not how I was raised when I graduated in from college and was intending to go to law school. I wanted to be a civil rights attorney. And then I joined the Border Patrol. And, you know, nowadays the Border Patrol is like our suicide rates are so high because Biden won't let us do our job. That's not why your suicide rates are so high. That's not why your corruption rates are so high. The reason why all those things happen so prevalently in the Border Patrol the corruption rates are five times that of any other law enforcement agency. It, it's just, it, it's crazy in the border patrol. And the reason why is because you put out this concept of honor first and that you're humanitarians and that you're out there to, to save migrants and protect the country. But at the same time, after a certain amount of time, about a year or two, you start to understand that it's all bullshit. It's all political. It's all lies. And that you're treating human beings and especially if you're a latino agent or a latina agent you're treating human beings that look just like you and speak the same language as you do a lot of times and you're treating them horribly and agents do not understand that at the end of the day that brutality and that cruelty comes home and that's why they have more divorce rates they have more domestic violence than anybody else and they end up addicted to drugs and alcohol, like so many of my classmates and, and friends. I had spent so many years trying to address my own trauma and trying to understand it and what I went through in the Border Patrol. And what I realized in having that quietness and the moment to calm down and, and drugs, obviously, to help what I was going through psychologically and so forth, is that my trauma was tied to the trauma that I dished out as a border patrol agent. It's not to say, I, and I was not a brutal border patrol agent. I have my moments. Yeah. But 
it, it is to say that the culture and, and what you're doing as an agent and forcing people. And I also had the advantage too of seeing like before deterrence policies and after deterrence policies and what those deterrence policies did. And I worked in the high desert in the mountains where we had a lot of deaths. So I was exposed to a lot of that. Um, and and I just realized that it, if I wanted to address my own trauma, if I wanted to heal mentally and, and, and physically, but mostly mentally and perhaps spiritually, then I had to look at what I did as an agent and I had to accept responsibility for that. And I had to look at the entire system that I was so willing to support and everything. So my big, my biggest aha moment, and I had a lot of them, even as a border patrol agent where I doubted what I was doing and stuff. My biggest one was my suicide attempt in 2015. And that's when I, it, the book, the going and listening to migrants with an open mind and, and not, you know, with the border patrol propaganda that had been put in my head for so many years, um, being forefront when I was uh, talking to people or listening to people, I should say. And it was just like, it's been the best thing I've ever done. It's been one of the hardest things I've ever done, but it's also been one of the best things that I've ever done because everything became so clear to me. And I just, especially that it coincided with Donald Trump and I mean, I knew as a Southern woman when I watched him come down those escalators and the escalator and say the, you know, Mexicans aren't sending their greatest people here and all that shit. I knew what that was as a Southern woman. I knew what that was as a Border Patrol agent. I knew what that was as a white American from Gen X and all that other stuff. And I just was like, you know, that question of what would you have done if you were in 1930s, 1940s Germany? What would you have done if you were in the 1960s during the civil rights movement? And I thought, I know a lot about this stuff. I know way more than even a lot of border patrol agents know because I was, I, I got up to the rank of a senior patrol agent, which they don't have anymore, but it's the highest rank under management. And I did some management, um, details where I was a temporary supervisor. So I knew about the secret cover up teams. I knew about the rape culture and how they got away with it. I knew about, I knew about all the stuff that they do. Um, and I, and it just became, it became therapy for me to write the book and to start talking about and researching and talking about what the border patrol actually is. And I think they won't admit it. And of course, nobody admits it, but it's like everything I've been talking about has come to pass and it's true so obviously i know what i'm talking about but why let me ask you this though why do you why do you think that immigrant rights should matter to americans so i truly believe that and and it sounds kind of woo woo or whatever but i truly believe that we all belong to one another i i truly believe that um you know, that we're not all okay until we're all okay. You know, I think that there's a, a measure of responsibility that we don't see in the United States. We don't have communal responsibility. You know, we just kind of within our own families stick to ourselves and say, this is what I'm responsible for. We might have, you know, like people have a church community that they might feel a little bit of responsibility for, but overall, um, I think that we miss out on the fact that um, we're not so different, you know, that we we all want, you know, to, to lay down at the end of the day and know that we will wake up tomorrow and that we'll be able to do the things that we need to do for our families and that, you know, we can um, be relatively safe where we live and things like that. And I think that, I think the issue is that there's that dehumanizing, but also devaluing um, thing that happens with, especially, you know, Western mindsets, because we think we've cornered the market on everything. You know, we think that <laughs> like, we're the best, we are going to tell everybody else how to do everything. I don't know. It, it really, I think, comes down to um, 
the lack of value in other human beings. And so I think that those of us that understand that we all have value and that we all um, deserve to have human rights and to, you know, have an opportunity to live life and feel safe and all those things like, I think we just have to keep fighting that fight, you know, and, and trying to, um, do whatever is within our power to sway that so that, you know, people are given, given opportunities to live a safe life. But yeah, well, do you, I'm you grateful. Want to invite others to become active is what you had mentioned. Yeah. Mentioned. So, um, I just, some of the orgs that I kind of follow, I just wanted to throw out there because people can, you know, financially support them. They can sometimes go like Abara has those, um, they call it like a border immersion trip where you go and you can cross over into Mexico with them and they kind of give you an idea of, like I said, they go over the policies with you and they tell you, you know, this is what people are waiting on and you get to go and meet people that are, you know, waiting. Um, and of course you get to talk to border patrol. Um, but so Abara is in El Paso. Um, there's a couple of works that I kind of stay, um, I just kind of watch to see what they have going on, but Brownsville on the other side is Angry Tias and Abuelas. There's Team Brownsville that does a lot of really great work as far as like helping people as they cross, getting them on buses, making sure they have, you know, they are able to use a cell phone or they have, um, sometimes they get the like disposable cell phones and give them out, but they make sure that they're fed and they've got enough to get where they're going. Um, Sister Norma, of course, um, in McAllen, she's kind of, she pretty much ran the camp in Matamoros. Um, she had the other orgs there that were helping, but she kind of oversaw the whole thing. And um, she actually has like a, what do they call it? A respite center where she helps people the same way. Like she, you know, she they can stay there for a few days if they need to. She makes sure that they're fed and they've got what they need to, to get to family members. Um, there's an organization called Practice Mercy in McAllen as well. They go across the border um, several times a week to take diapers and vitamins and um, different things like that. They, you know, try to see what the greatest needs are and then they usually do a little bit of fundraising so that they can get those items and, and take them across. Um, the Rio Grande Borderland Ministries is out of Marfa, and um, I've had a couple of really great conversations with um, the guy that runs that. He's actually an Episcopal priest, um, and he here's something interesting that you may not have known, but um, he started a counseling service for Border Patrol agents because at one point. Um, one of the agents told him that that whatever counseling was available to them, that they, they had open records and that the supervisors were allowed to see what they were talking about. Yeah, that's why you never. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so <laughs> they'll, take your, they'll take your gun and it and even the women who are raped by other uh, Border Patrol agents, if you tell them you need therapy, they'll take your gun. So it's like, jeez. So he said that the uh, that the way that that came about was when when they were just starting to um, do the child separation, and he ran into an agent like out on a on a road somewhere. The guy had his truck had broken down or whatever, but he was talking to him about it. And he said that that guy started like he like broke down crying and said, you know, I have two little ones at home, and I did not sign up to take people's children away. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of agents for what it's worth. I did have a lot of very young agents who, like me, didn't understand what they were joining and they were falling apart in the Trump administration. They were. Yeah. So a lot of suicides. Right. And I, I totally get that. Um, so anyway, he, he made this program for them and he's also done a lot to try to um, build relationship between the community and Border Patrol. And then of course, KIND, which is Kids in Need of Defense. Um, I love them, I love their organization. Um, 
we have, I've talked a lot with um, Jennifer Podko, which is the, um, I want to say she's the director of policy for them. But, um, but she's great because I can just reach out to her and say, hey, Jen, can I, you know, can we get on a, a call and you catch me up with what's going on? And, you know, she, she's always happy to do that. So, but um, my advice for everyone would be to actually go, you know, to go and see for yourself, um, because I don't think there's anything that um, impacts you the same way and to hear the stories. And, and if you can't do that, you know, talk to people in your community like there are tons of like churches that are specific you know like there might be spanish-speaking churches that you could go and you could actually somehow connect and you know hear people's stories or whatever whatever it may be but i just think that um people that actually care about the issue you know there's there's so much to be done right like there's there's tons of work and not enough workers so yep. and i'm always encouraging people to you know to go get the schooling and become a um, accredited rep too because when we did the math for delaware it was like for every one person who's qualified to do this work there's like a thousand four hundred sixty five people that need services right. so we definitely need more people doing this <laughs> Right, definitely. I want to mention a few programs that I know about um, in uh, Matamoras and Reynosa is the sidewalk school with Felicia and Victor. Yes. Those two are amazing. I love those two. Uh, Las Americas in El Paso, they go back and forth into Juarez and they assist migrants. Uh, Al Otro Lado in uh, Tijuana. And Kino Initiative in Nogales uh, are groups that are always uh, an Espacio Migrante in um, in Tijuana. Also, there's there's so many to name, but I want to thank you for uh, coming on today and and having not necessarily a lighter conversation, <laughs> but maybe a, a more personal conversation about what it is to that makes us get up every day and bang our heads against the same brick wall over and over and over again. So Yep. And like you said, we have to look for the helpers because they're they're out there, you know? And if they weren't, then I don't know what I would do. But there's tons of people doing great things every day and I definitely have to balance myself by looking at that. Yeah, definitely. All right. So, but thanks Jen. I appreciate um the opportunity to come on and chat with you. Thank you.